All right, welcome everyone who's joining us tonight for the PSAA Presents Winter Seed Sowing event. Uh, we're joined tonight by Master Gardener Andy Faust. We'll be getting started here in just a few minutes. I'm gonna run the slideshow here. Um, just a reminder, live closed captions are available for the event tonight. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom, you can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom window and then clicking show subtitle. If you're joining us on Facebook tonight, uh, you can use the custom link provided in the event description. Good. Looks like the Zoom room's filling up here tonight. Um, you can feel free to drop in the chat where you're joining us from tonight. We'll get started in a few minutes. <clears throat> As I mentioned, Andy's going to be walking us, talk to us tonight about the process of winter seed sowing. Um, in addition, he's gonna be happy to take some time at the end of the program to answer any other general gardening questions you might have. So you can feel free um, towards the end there to drop those in the Q&A tab in Zoom, or you can drop them in the comments if you're joining us on Facebook. All right, we've got I see Maryland, Vermont, Pittsburgh, Louisiana, Ohio, Connecticut, Tennessee, Buffalo, Valley Forge, another Maryland, California. A lot of people um, interested in some winter seed sowing here. So that's exciting. And like I said, we'll be getting here started here in just a minute. Even see someone here from Pittsburgh, Carrie, my hometown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's your hometown? Very cool. Yeah, I'm from Pittsburgh, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Right. So like we said here, um, Andy's going to be joining us. He's going to talk to us about the process of winter seed sowing. Um, in addition, he'll be happy to answer those questions towards the end. Um, Andy has spent over 17 years in the green industry, with various private and public organizations, including Lesco, John Deere, and Site One Supply. Um, he currently serves as the Education and Strategy Manager and Master Gardener Coordinator with Penn State Extension. Andy's a 1998 graduate of Penn State, earning a BS in Landscape Contracting and a minor in Agricultural Business. He also holds an MBA from the Jack Welch Institute, Management Institute. And now I will go ahead and turn the program over to Andy to get us started. So thank you for joining us, Andy. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Carrie. And it's good to see everyone here tonight. I see uh, people or folks are putting in where you're from. That's wonderful. Uh, I even saw there from Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh. So um, shout out to Pittsburgh PA, um, go Steelers. Uh, so I'm gonna share my uh, PowerPoint here and get this up and running. And we can begin. Sherry sure, can keep me uh, on, on task with time too as we move forward here tonight. Right. Okay, here we go. Okay, good. Well, good evening, everyone. Once again, uh, on, on behalf of Penn State Extension uh, Master Gardener Program, uh, I'd like to thank you for registering for today's uh, winter sowing event. I'm really excited about this. Um, even have a uh, last year's garden behind me. Um, actually, it's a garden from a uh, from Penn State Extension Area Master Gardener Program, uh, which is really good. So those of you that are uh, in the midst of this winter uh, ice and the snow that came through here in Central PA, um, this is nice to see, right? Uh, visual, good visual for our eyes. Uh, thanks, Carrie, for the intro. Uh, yes, my name is Andy Faust. I'm an area master garden coordinator uh, for the northwest corner of Pennsylvania uh, and a master gardener here in Center County. I live here with my, uh, my wife and our two boys, um, two cats and a dog here in Center County. So this, some of this is relevant to our uh, winter seed sowing that I'll get into uh, in a bit. Um, in the 15 counties that I help uh, serve here in the northwest corner of Pennsylvania, we have over 500 uh, master gardeners uh, volunteering their time um, and educating, you know, educating our communities. All right. Um, so we'll get into this. Uh, across the state, uh, we have over 3,500 master gardeners, um, certified master gardeners carrying out our mission uh, to support Penn State Extension outreach by utilizing unbiased research-based information uh, to educate the public in our communities on best practices 
uh, in sustainable horticulture and environmental stewardship, right? Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Master Gardener program, uh, please visit our website. Uh, you'll see a link. Uh, Harry's going to put a link in the chat um, along with our newsletter sign up. So if you're interested in learning more about the program, um, jump into the link or sign up for our newsletter. We have a monthly newsletter that we put out uh, each, each month uh, with a lot of good information uh, relative to what we're working on and our, our outreach across, um, across the state. Okay. Uh, and perhaps um, some of you may want to become master gardeners. Uh, we would love that. Um, so uh, feel free to um, reach out to me as well. My email is uh, avf alpha victor frank 100 at psu.edu. Uh, avf 100 at psu.edu. Uh, if you have a question, like Carrie said, you can enter it in the Q&A, and towards the end of the program today, we can spend time to answer some of those questions. Um, but with that, we're going to get moving into winter sowing. Before we go begin, though, we want to start with uh, learning a little bit about you. All right, so please tell me a little bit about your experience growing plants uh, from seeds, okay? Uh, which of these statements best describes you? Are you a, a beginner, a new gardener, or always, you know, just bought plants? Um, have you, you know, do you seed outdoors only, plant seeds outdoors only in the spring and summer? Uh, do you grow uh, your own seedlings indoors uh, with or without special uh, lighting? Or, um, or have you grown seeds that need special pretreatment to germinate? So answer one of those. What are you, a new gardener? Do you plant seeds outdoors only uh, in spring and summer? Do you grow your own seedlings indoors? Uh, or you grow seeds that need special treatment? So go ahead and um, you'll see a poll question pop up and you can answer that. And let's see how we're, see how we're making progress here with the polls. Okay. All right, looks like it's, looks like it's pretty split. Um, 30, 30%, 25%, 33%. So the majority of you are newer gardeners or you plant seeds outdoors. Um, or you grow seedlings indoors, okay, and some of you do special treatments for seeds, okay, great. Well, I think what we have tonight is going to fit, um, you know, all of your, your needs, all right, which is great. Uh, let's do one more, and this kind of dives into winter sowing. So um, what is winter sowing? What do you think it is? Is it planting seeds in your garden beds in the wintertime? Is it growing seeds indoors under lights, keeping seed containers in, in the refrigerator? To, uh, to simulate winter conditions or none of the above. What do you think? Take a guess if you're unsure. Um, I have a feeling that um, most of you know the answer. Um, if you're on this webinar, maybe you've done some research in the past on winter sowing, or maybe you've you kind of heard it, it's uh, the last decade or so, it's really become quite popular for, for the winter time. All right, Carrie, how are we making out with the, all right. Oh, wow. So it looks like 58% of you um, are saying that growing seeds indoors under lights in winter. All right. And then 22% of you said none of the above. Well, the answer is none of the above. Okay. So we have lots of learning to, to do tonight, right? So let's kind of move on into uh, to winter sowing. Okay, great. Okay. So what is winter sowing? So the USDA defines winter, winter sowing as a propagation method used throughout the winter where temperate climates are sown into protective vented containers, protected vented containers and placed outdoors to foster naturally timed high percentage germination of climate tolerant seedlings. All right, this method was developed by a woman, woman named Trudy Davidoff in 1999. Uh, and she first shared it on gardenweb.com. Uh, I think in the summer of maybe 2000, 2001, and she now hosts a group on Facebook called Winter Sower. So if any of you are interested in uh, are on Facebook, um, you can search for uh, Winter Sowers. All right. So kudos to Trudy for bringing this to light. Uh, about the photo there uh, with the crate, uh, if you're in a very windy area like I am here in right in central Pennsylvania near the university, uh, one way to keep our containers from blowing away is to put them in uh, milk crates. Right. So we'll talk more about that as we go on. So let's jump into 10 reasons why to winter sow. 10 reasons to winter sow. Uh, first, it's easy, all right? It's simple. It's one of the simplest, really, seed starting methods, all right? Two, it's inexpensive. 
Uh, really, the, the only um, cost involved here is the growing medium, uh, which is pretty much the main expenditure. Uh, we have and use any kind of recycled materials for this, uh, aka milk cartons, milk jugs, um, and seeds. Maybe you have seeds already. Maybe you, you have a seed sharing event. Maybe you, you pass some seeds around within the family uh, or purchase them. Okay. Um, number three, it saves indoor space. I don't know about you, but um, here in our house, we have uh, our two boys and a uh, dog and two cats, and we don't have a lot of space. So we have to be mindful of the space we have. So it saves uh, indoor, indoor space. And you don't really need, number four, any kind of special equipment for this. Uh, it doesn't require electrical equipment, lights, uh, refrigeration. Some of you noted that you, you do some specialized uh, lighting for seed starting and that's fine indoors. Um, it's fun to do, but you don't need lights, refrigeration, um, heat, heating mats to, um, to increase the, the soil temperature. Um, that's, that's unnecessary for, for winter sowing. All right. Number five, seeds are protected. Yes, from erosion by wind, um, you know, in extreme conditions, uh, precipitation and from you know, hungry critters or pests that could be outside. Okay. So uh, protection. Six, it's self watering most of the time. Okay. And, and most years, I should say, uh, soil remains at ideal moisture levels for germination, which is important. Uh, generally without, you know, without your assistance, right? Number seven, it eliminates the guesswork, um, you know, over precise timing. So, you know, when do I start putting my seeds out? Well, hmm, the weather looks like this or looks like that. It's all about taking time and eliminating that guesswork, right? So this does, it eliminates the guesswork. Um, seeds germinate when the conditions are favorable for growth of that species, okay? Uh, number eight, it produces healthy, stocky, ready to plant seedlings. Okay. More really, more than you, more than you will expect usually. Um, disease and, and legginess um, and hardening off of, of seedlings is sometimes challenging, right? Um, they are not concerns when we do winter sowing. Okay. So another, another good um, upside. Uh, number nine is fun. It, it really is fun. And I hope tonight, uh, you will you will gather that it is really a fun experience. We we make it a family event. We you know get our boys involved. Um, it's fun for gardeners of, of all ages. All right. Uh, so move on to uh, and and I should say last but not least uh, number ten. Um, it staves off the winter blues. Okay. So we are daydreaming at least here in the East Coast right now. Not for those of you that are out West Coast as much, but uh, we're daydreaming about uh, our gardens here. Um, I am. Right, and so you can start now. Yeah, you don't have to wait. You can start your garden really now. Okay, um, and as a bonus too, it's it's really flexible. Um, you know, within the definition of uh, of winter sowing, is many ways to tailor it to to your needs and what you have available at your own home. All right. Okay, so a couple. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into seed dormancy. All right, and talk about um, seed stratification. And scarification a little bit. This is information that's good for you to, to know. And then we're going to go through some of the supplies needed and kind of work through building uh, your winter sowing container. Okay. So why is winter sowing even necessary? Why not just wait until the warm weather breaks, right? Uh, till we plant. Well, let's talk about a condition that affects many seeds. And you've heard this before, I'm sure. It's called dormancy. Dormancy. So what is what is dormancy? What is dormancy? You know, dormancy is defined as in simple terms as you know really being in a state of reduced physiological activity right the seeds in a deep sleep all right but what does it take to wake it up what does it take to wake it up so to take it a little bit deeper um, it's a survival mechanism right by which seeds can delay germination uh, until the right environmental conditions for seedling growth and development okay so in other words to survive the seed stays dormant until four, four vital conditions uh, take place, okay? Water, light, oxygen, and heat, all right? And these are all at the right levels for germination and su successful growth of the new plant, okay? And these levels needed can be different for, for different species. So just remember that, water, light, oxygen, and heat, okay? Now, and but, dormancy all is also defined as a mechanism that prevents a viable seed from germinating when placed in an ideal environment 
for germination. Okay, so let's just say these four conditions are right. The seed's healthy, but the seed doesn't sprout. Okay, why? So there's some other trigger that's needed to initiate this germination. Okay, um, do any of you know it? I don't know. Do you? This function of dormancy helps spread out the germination of seeds um, over space and time. Okay, so most temperate climate annual flowers and vegetable seeds don't do, don't have really a dormancy, um, especially at the last part of the, of the definition. But other temperate plants like woody ornamentals. Um, perennials and, and fruits too, some fruits do have dormant seeds, okay? So special treatments may be required to break that, that dormancy, all right? Um, scarf, scarf, scarification, sorry, scarification and stratification are two methods to break this dormancy, okay? Scarification and stratification. So we're gonna take a look at those next. All right, seed stratification. Some seeds will not germinate uh, unless they have been moist chilled during the winter, all right? These seeds can simply be planted uh, in a prepared seed bed in the fall or even sprinkled in the snow, okay? But this really isn't sowing in the winter. That's not, that's really sowing in the winter, not winter sowing, all right? But however, the simple method um, does not protect the seeds from being eaten by, by wildlife um, or rodents outside or lost to you know, any type of extreme weather pattern that's moving by, okay? Uh, so in planting seeds that are expensive, you, maybe you have some rare seeds, um, um, you know, passed down from generation. You know, they're, maybe they're rare, they're expensive, or they're valued in some way. Um, germination can be carried out with the process of controlled stratification, okay? So think about that word, stratification. And during stratification, it's important that temperatures are cold and the media is moist, okay? Uh, moisture must get into the seed. The moisture must imbibe the seed for that to take place, right? Now, if temperatures are below freezing, seeds don't, do not perceive that cold treatment, right? They don't germinate until the temperatures have been in the right you know, range um, for the correct period of time. Um, so placing seeds in the freezer is not you know, st strictly stratification, okay? All right, so there's two methods that exist to stratify seeds, and this is good for you to know, um, using the refrigerator um, to simulate, you know, the winter temperature. So uh, first one is seeds can be planted, I uh, say planted in a pot that's been filled with a, a porous medium. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, usually sand, perlite, or vermiculite, uh, covering the seeds with a one, like a half inch or so of medium, um, watering the pot thoroughly and placing it in a plastic bag, right? That's one way. Uh, that we can start that process, all right, of stratification, or just put perlite in uh, in in seeds uh, in a bag, and simply moisten them, um, and you know maybe cut the one side of the bag uh, to drain off any kind of excess water. Okay, now if we do this and put the bag or the pot, you know, in, in the refrigerator for ten to twelve weeks, um, or the recommended time that the species that calls for, um, when the cold period is complete. If you would remove the container from the refrigerator and place in a, in a warmer environment um, that's got light, uh, the seeds will then begin to germinate, right? The photo on the right uh, is a refrigerator filled with seeds uh, being stratified. Um, you know, you can store, you know, longer than that. 10 to 12 weeks is most of the time if you, if you need to, but you can check for, check for occasionally for signs of germination while they're in there, that does, that does take place, all right? So it's important to understand that the stratification uh, process, all right? There's also outdoor stratification. So seeds can be stratified outdoors as well um, in the late fall, um, you know, in a more controlled manner. Now this is a very controlled environment outside. Uh, you simply direct sow uh, like in a nursery bed area. They place several inches of moistened sand uh, or mix of a sand and peat uh, across a, a pot or a flat. Uh, you can place the seeds on top of the medium and then another layer of sand or vermiculite. Uh, cover the top of the pot with a hardware cloth um, and secure it with some, some bands to protect the seeds from any kind of rodents. Um, place in a cold frame. This is a cold frame uh, to insulate the seeds from, from freezing temperatures. Okay, so this is outdoor stratification. You can also do uh, uh, have window screens can also be used to protect the seeds from birds. So if you put uh, a flat outside 
uh, with some screens over top, you can do that as well to stratify. So while these methods of stratification, you know, may or must be done in the winter, they're, they are not what defines winter sowing, all right? So remember, winter sowing is done, remember going back to our definition, winter sowing is done in a protective vented containers. So no refrigerator or cold frame uh, is necessary, right? So that, again, that's one of the upsides um, to doing this. All right, we're gonna move on. So you're learning about uh, stratification. Now we're gonna jump into um, scarification, right? What is scarification? So another method used to help break dormancy is scarification. Uh, many seeds have this hard, thick, you know, like waxy coat, um, you know, on them that resists water, all right? Now, simply making a small uh, nick or a, a thin spot in that seed or cutting that seed coat uh, allows it to uptake water. Again, it's imbibing the water, right? And start on the path to germination. This is necessary, all right? Now, you can do this with, um, with sandpaper. Um, scarification can take place using sandpaper. You can use, some folks use uh, like an emery board, a file. Um, I just use a sharp blade um, or a nail uh, just to break that barrier break that waxy coat barrier. Uh, for the, the lupine seeds on the left in the first photo, um, sandpaper is you know, sufficient. Uh, the ripe photo that you see there are bald cypress seeds, um, and you would need a metal file to, to really get um, poked through that waxy coating, all right? But exposing them to extreme um, you know, temperature extremes like you know, freezing, followed by a plunge in like say very hot water um, can also crack that that seed coat too, right? So seeds are sometimes uh, scarified with acid. Uh, if, if you never heard of that before, um, sometimes they're scarified with acid and really mimics their passage through uh, an animal's gut, which is really interesting. interesting. Um, there are even seeds that require um, like smoke treatments too, right? So there's, there's many different needs depending on the species um, for scarification, okay? Um, and some of these special treatments um, you know, we can mention further on in the presentation, right? But after scare, scarifying, the seeds are soaked in water until they swell, uh, and then they're planted, all right? So while, while scarification uh, may be needed to aid in breaking the dormancy uh, in indoor sowing, it's almost never uh, necessary with winter sowing, okay? So with winter sowing, you don't have to worry about this, right? It happens naturally. If you're inside, then you would have to be thinking about these things, right? So I'll just say it again, while scarification may be needed to aid in breaking dormancy and in indoor sowing, it's almost never necessary uh, with winter sowing, okay? So remember that. All right, we're gonna move on to um, getting started with, uh, with winter sowing. So we have to choose some containers, all right? And uh, if you have your supply list, I know you all probably received a, a supply list. Uh, we're gonna go through some things. Um, and you can, you can start to build your winter sowing um, container as we go through it. Um, if we run out of time or go, if I'm going a little too fast, don't be, um, that's okay. At the very end, we'll leave a, a fact sheet that kind of goes through what we're talking about. So you still have the steps involved, all right? But the, really the first step in getting started is choosing a container, all right? So the easiest options um, that you see here, um, first thing, um, our milk jugs, right? It's the class. Milk jugs are the classic winter sewing option, right? That's what I that's what I use, and I'll show you what I have uh, here in a little in a little bit. Uh, milk jugs, all right? It's a classic winter sewing option. They work they work very well, uh, but it's not the only thing that you can use, all right? Um, some folks like to use uh, soda bottles, right? two liter soda bottles, right? There, um, and some some people will use the smaller soda bottles too, right? Um, but you want to get at least four inches of soil uh, in the bottom of these containers, okay, four inches of soil. Um, I've used smaller bottles up to like the, what are they, 17 ounce, I think, 17 ounce bottles. I've used them for single, single seeds as well, um, and they work, you know, they work very good, okay. So milk jugs or soda bottles are a good choice to start. Um, some folks like to use the, the, the plastic food containers. Have you seen those? I'm sure you've used them, found them in the stores. If you use these shallow um, the produce containers, be prepared to transplant seedlings early, uh, mostly because of the, they're just more shallow, right? So we wanna try to 
we want to try to get at least four inches in the bottom, four inches of soil mix um, in the bottom of these containers. All right. So that's the first step. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the types of containers here. So, you know, we first talk about choosing containers. Now let's look at some of these options uh, for containers. Andy, we had a quick question here. Um, Kristen wanted sure. to know if a, if a half gallon milk jug would be okay instead of a full gallon. Uh, half gallon, yeah, half gallon will work fine. Um, the goal really, like I said, is if you can get three to four inches um, of mix on the bottom, that's what you're kind of aiming for, right? If you have less, just know that, uh, that it will dry out faster, okay? Yep, that help, Karen? Yes, okay. thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's look at uh, four visual categories uh, of the pla of the plastic that you might find. First is the clear or transparent ones. Let me get my pointer here. I think we can kind of go through these. This is the transparent. Um, these are, you know, the carry out food containers uh, that you say, and maybe this will be relevant to the question that just was posed. Um, it has room for both potting mix and the seedlings. Uh, pint containers have very little headspace. Um, you know, to put that four inches of, of potting mix in. Next is a translucent, right? So you can test for, um, for opaqueness. So if you put your fingers behind uh, the, the milk jug and, um, you know, if you see your fingers and it's not opaque, right? Um, it's, you know, translucent, right? So you wanna make sure you kind of do that test the translucent. Next are the green. So going back to these, these um, the two liter bottles, these are the greens. Um, they, they may be best for shade, you know, shade tolerant. Um, you know, I think of this as like similar as being under a tree. All right, you can use some; they will they will work fine. If you have though something that's opaque, um, and they're acceptable, but I would prefer you not use an opaque lid. All right. So if you have a if you have a translucent, um, uh, a transparent lid, then you will get more light, which you need that uh, from the top, right? But if you have an opaque one, you can use it. Just make sure the lid is um, you can see through it, and it's not opaque. All right, so I will suggest kind of stick with the transparent and the translucent containers um, that will really help you. Okay, so now we're talking about you know how we're going to get winter seeding, winter sowing started, the containers, the choices that you can use. Um, you know, a couple of different options for you when you do this, when you get started. All right, um, you know, consider even we talked about the these soda bottles, right? Consider the ease of removing the seedling. So if you look here, uh, this this small Pepsi container, um, it's it's straight, right? It's not curved at the bottom. So when you have your seed seedling in here, when it starts to, to germinate, uh, you can simply uh, pull the plant out. If it's, uh, you know, if it's kind of has the, um, the curvature to the bottom, it's a little bit more difficult um, to pull that out, right? So you might find yourself cutting the bottle um, to get, to remove the plant, okay? So some of these are, most containers like these, even the straight are a little bit more tapered at the bottom, but they're tapered in, the, in kind of the right direction. So just another, another option for you. If, you. if you have single seeds that you wanna try um, to germinate, all right? All right, we're gonna get into uh, different supplies. Uh, I think this one out with uh, everyone as you sign up for the, for the workshop here tonight. Just kind of go through some of the supplies, right? Uh, many different supplies and methods are discussed, and you can, if you're, you know, on any kind of online forums, um, there's so many different ideas with supplies and how to do winter sowing. Um, and here are some of the more common. These are probably the more common, right? So first, um, drainage. You need a tool for your drainage holes, right? So our containers, they need to flow water. They need to have water pass through the soil. You need a tool for your drainage holes um, or your water entry holes. Uh, for flat top containers, if that's what you're using. Um, so what do you have laying around the house that you can use? Um, you know, be smart about it, be, be sensible. I, I personally like to use um, just my power drill because I can easily um, uh, drill some holes in the bottom and, uh, and on the sides to secure um, the container, right? So first thing is to consider is drainage holes. How are you gonna make your drainage holes? Some folks like to use, um, you know, um, uh, a heated tool to poke a hole through it, you're right? Um, that's an option as well. Um, but I prefer just using a, a, a drill or something sharp is fine too. Uh, second, you need a tool for cutting open your container. So we'll kind of jump into where we're gonna be cutting your container uh, next, but choose a tool for cutting 
uh, knives, box cutters are fine. Um, some people use saws. I don't really like the use of saws, but um, you can use saws. Um, scissors are safe. If you have young helpers, you know, scissors work great. Uh, if you're doing many, many, many milk jugs, like we do, your hand can get quite sore every time. So make sure you're um, you maybe spacing it out and <laughs> doing some little each night. Um, you need labels, right, for the containers, and unless you're just doing one. Um, you're probably doing more. So uh, we'll discuss some option for, for labels um, here in a couple more slides. Permanent markers um, for outside. Uh, it's good to have some markers just to label on the outside. Uh, you need soilless media, right? You need some soilless media for it. You need seeds. Uh, like Again, you're buying seeds or you're swapping seeds. Um, you're collecting them. You know, most dormant seeds uh, can last for more than a year. So if you have a seed, um, if you have some seeds that are from last year and you're like, oh, they don't, they're not going to germinate, use them. All right, use them. Those seeds will last more than a year. Okay. Germination percentage rates might drop a bit, um, but try. Okay. Uh, and then closures. Closures are, you know, to close the containers, um, you know, we can use wire and kind of rubber, rubber laced uh, wire. Um, just to secure the top to the bottom, okay? Some people, some folks like to use duct tape um, or any kind of a ties, but I like just use, you know, wire just to secure, secure it shut, right? So next we're gonna jump into uh, preparing the container and, and go through um, preparing your container. So th there's two different ways here that I'm gonna talk about. And the first is right here, right? Two kind of styles. So what you want to do is, uh, for this example, with the with the milk jug, you want to draw a line about four inches from the bottom of the container, okay? And start on one side and draw that line around the whole container to the other side, all right? Leave the hinge uncut, right? So this is where going to be. This is where your hinge is going to be. So don't cut this part, right? And remove the cap. Okay, so take away the cap, draw the line around there, okay? That's going to be your mark to cut and leave this hinge area right here. Now, some folks, uh, I never really did this way, but I'll, I'll probably try some this year, is I'll keep the hinge on the label side. So you wouldn't cut where the label is, you would cut uh, around the backside starting here and going around to the other side, all right? Personal preference, all right? Some, some master gardeners and community folks say, I like, the, I like to have the label there so I can put the name of what I have inside of it. Um, try it different ways, right? Try it out. Okay. All right. So the first way here, and then a second option is here as well. All right. Uh, again, going back to the hinges, the hinges on the milk jug. Um, we kind of talked about it can be either, on, either be on one side here. Or it can either be on uh, the label side. All right. Um, well, I guess one benefit of having the, the hinge on the label side is it does give a little more strength um, because it's a little bit wider of the hinge. So that might help, might help you especially if you have some, you know, strong winds uh, where you live, okay? Now, before you start to cut in this area, we need to add something. We need to add some drainage holes, right? So uh, pull out your, your drill. Um, it's easier to do this before you cut the bottom, the bottle or the jug, right? So um, before you start to cut, let's get some holes in the bottom of, of your milk container. Uh, the holes don't need to be perfectly round. Right, and the number uh, that you make is is another kind of personal choice. Uh, at a minimum, if you have four or five holes, quarter inch size holes in the bottom uh, of your container, it's fine, right? Um, that's totally fine. I wouldn't space them closer than an inch, right, if you're doing that. So you need to have drainage. So uh, you can use a tool to put holes in the bottom of the drainage container, um, and then we can move on. If you opt out, opt for like melting holes, like I said before, if you have a soldering iron or or a hot screwdriver if you ever use those before, um, or a glue gun, something like that. Just make sure you're you have some good ventilation right in there because it can be pretty uh, pretty unpleasant if you have loose fumes. Um, I've done that before, yeah. So just make sure you have that in the vented area. Um, if you use produce or other food containers, like we mentioned before, you also need to make some holes in the flat part on the top of the container um, if they don't already exist, right? So because you need to have the water flow, water to be able to come in. And you need to have that air exchange, okay? That's uh, that's essential, so it can circulate with the container, right? So before you hurt the cut, make sure you spend time and uh, put some holes in the bottom of the drainage, right? Um, and while you're making the holes, 
you can um, even start a hole on your cutting line, just make it a little bit easier uh, to start the cut. Because if you ever taken scissors into the plastic jug, it's a little bit, it's hard to get in there, right? So drill a little hole or make a, make a, um, um, make a cut there on the side, right? All right, so uh, we understand now how to, you know, what container to use, uh, kind of labeling the side of the container, uh, four inches from the bottom. Before we cut, we want to put drainage holes in, all right? And uh, let's, let's go on to the cutting phase. Okay. Um, so we want to do is cut the corner or cut the container open, leaving this hinge, which is what we talked about earlier, right? Jugs seem to be made, you know, with a kind of a thinner and thinner plastic each year. So you might find it easier to, um, to cut with a heavy pair of scissors, especially um, if you punched a, like a starting hole, right? So, um, so you can make that cut around and leave the hinge, right? Or you can cut the one side, leaving your hinge on the other side, like we talked about. Okay. So make sure you do that. Andy, we now, have a quick question here. Um, yes. Yep. I to know if the, the jug or the container should be sterilized first. Yeah, good question. Wonderful question. You should always uh, rinse, you know, triple rinse your container um, with some water, right? And um, and dry it out first. Uh, I would recommend just to, just to rinse it and let it dry. Um, I haven't really sterilized them in the past, but um, it's really good to, um, to triple rinse, you know, triple rinse that area, get any kind of, get the milk out, whatever you have and let it sit and dry. Okay. That's okay to do. That's fine. Okay, next, make sure you punch a hole. Uh, this is kind of optional, but um, you can punch a hole in the side of the, of the container. Um, that way you can use uh, help with your, your piece of wire for your closure, right? So if you want um, to place a label on the bottom, now is a good time uh, to put a label um, on the container before we fill with soil. Okay, something, something to think about. Um, and if you're following along at home, I'm just gonna show you what uh, what it will look like at this point. So this is a container here. This is my container, a milk jug. I had made cuts in it. I like to use this hinge part, as you can see right here, this is the hinge. So I cut around the side and I secured it. I had two holes. You can see the holes that I made there, one on top and one below where I cut. And I'm just using some wire that I had left over uh, from the holidays just to secure that secure that side, right? This is gonna be my kale, uh, cool season crop. I like to, uh, we love to eat kale. Um, kale sandwiches are really good. So that's what, if you're following it along at home and you're at, at this space, this is what um, it should look like. And after you punch that hole in the side, uh, both sides, then you can use your uh, coated wire um, to just secure it, okay? It can be any kind of wire just to secure. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to the next slide, uh, which is soil. So we got to fill the container, right? So we have our container. Uh, we have a cut correctly, cut how we want it to do. We have our, our holes, um, drainage holes uh, in the bottom. We have our holes to secure the, the fastener on the side. Now we have to fill. So fill the container with pre moistened seed starter medium. Um, so avoid mixes that say weed free. All right, they can contain an anti-germinant or um, some type of preventative chemical that uh, prevents all seeds from germinating. Okay, so remember that. Uh, and be sure to use a good quality mix, right? Um, you know, one that will, will remain uh, loose and, and it's called friability. It's friable and that's having the correct uh, air spaces for the roots, all right? So one that's loose and friable and it's good for, for drainage. Um, you know, it makes it easy for, for sprouting. You don't want it to become hard, um, like a hard brick, right? So let's talk about that because it's important when we talk about what mix to use. Do we use potting soil? Do we use potting mix? So what's potting soil? So potting soil refers to uh, any growth medium which contains dirt, right? Uh, either partially or completely. And this easily compacts and be can become very, very waterlogged, right? Potting soil. Uh, now, potting mix, however, uh, it's soilless. It's soilless, soilless media, which has uh, specifically developed to produce, you know, better gardening results for 
inside containers, four containers. So for this specific purpose, um, it, can, it may contain perlite, uh, may contain peat moss, most times peat moss, peat moss perlite, um, or, or even pine bark, okay? Uh, now it's, at stores, you might even see something called seed starting mix. Uh, and that can be used, but remember most brands have, um, you know, very few nutrients or fertilizers in them. So they're really only meant to be used for a few weeks uh, until the true leaves uh, begin to form. And then it's when it's time to transplant in, into a soilless potting mix, um, since your seedlings will be, you know, sufficiently hardened off, um, then they, they can be planted directly into the final location, right? So it's important just to remember when you're looking for your, your mix, find something that says a potting mix, okay? And not a potting soil, okay? Potting mix, not a, not a potting soil, okay? Uh, and if you use a seed starting mix, just know that um, it's short-lived as far as nutrient value, all right? Most of the time, okay? Um, also, more and more that I've found, uh, you know, mixes as far as potting mixes um, are appearing that have... Um, that have enough fertilizer added for the entire growing season. So um, you'll see that in, in some, um, some brands, okay? So they're acceptable choices and you can use them, uh, but not necessary since you should plan um, to do your transplanting while the seedlings are pretty small, right? So at that stage, they don't need a lot of nutrients. It's okay to have some nutrients in there, um, but you may not need that, you need all the nutrients, but they're okay to use, okay, just so you know that. All right, so we're filling our container with soil. Um, and then next we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to add our seed. Okay. So, um, you know, add sand seeds are in different sizes, right? Some seeds are larger, some are smaller. Um, if you're, if you're planting, you know, you know, lettuce, for example, lettuce seeds are very small. Um, and it's sometimes hard to disperse over the area. So you can just a trick is to mix, mix the seeds in with uh, some sand, uh, just to get an even distribution, uh, when you're sowing those. Okay, so you can use that to help out. All right. Okay, move on. Um, cover seeds with uh, with a little bit of more of your mix and and mix. Right. So don't don't forget to um, uh, to label. So we got to label. You got to make sure you're going to label um, the container as well. Right. Um, check the seed packet or online to to really determine if you have a type of seed that. Um, it should be left uncovered, right? Otherwise, a good rule of thumb when you're seeding um, is to cover the seeds no more than four times their diameter, right? So four times, rule of thumb, four times, no more than four times their diameter. So, uh, and even if you leave the seeds on the surface, it's okay. Um, most times with the, the winter freeze thaw um, that will settle the seeds um, down to the appropriate depth, right? So, that, so that's okay, that's okay to do. Um, sow the seeds on top and you can moisten them You can spray them with the mist um, or just know that the freeze thaw cycle as they become moist uh, will take them down okay and don't forget the label so uh, if you're like me you're going to forget what's in your container especially if you have you know 20 30 uh, containers outside right so we're going to talk about um, you know how to what, just some ideas for labeling them and then we're going to get into choosing choosing your seeds all right Let's jump into, um, spend a few minutes covering labeling ideas, okay? So here's, uh, here's some ideas for you for labeling. And it's important, I think it's important because, um, you know, when these are outside in the, in the elements, um, they can easily be, be washed off, right? So, um, so first one, first opportunity is using a piece of duct tape on the bottom, all right? Um, you can use duct tape, uh, the, and these are pretty popular. So you can use duct tape on the bottom uh, where the sunlight, you know, won't, won't fade it. Uh, you can also, uh, you can also just, you know, write around directly on the side, right? So New England Aster, uh, if you cut off the top of the jug, then, you know, obviously you're going to lose the writing on that half. So, um, so we have, our, you know, you can use duct tape, you can use, you can write it on the side. Uh, you can also use labels and may create labels and put the labels uh, inside. It's always a good, it's always a good practice. Um, put a label on the inside. Uh, I don't know if you have used vinyl blinds at all or have any old vinyl blinds, but 
they make great labels. <laughs> okay, they're very inexpensive because you don't use them anymore. If uh, take some blinds and make some cuts, and um, very inexpensive way to create a label, uh, you can make hundreds of tags. You know, with this with a simple with a simple blind. Okay, uh, and then you can also use uh, tags, right? So some folks like to use tags if you have a lot of different um, containers. Um, you know, you can just number your tag and then you may have a book inside or uh, on the computer and you can, um, you have it written down. Number 42 is, is my New England Aster. Okay. All right. A couple of things too. Don't use, uh, a reg don't use regular Sharpies for labeling. Um, Sharpies will fade. They will fade pretty quickly, actually. So upgrade to an industrial type Sharpie. They are, they do exist. So use an industrial uh, Sharpie. It's a good tip because um, uh, it will fade on you, right? Um, or you can use uh, like a paint marker is good too. Um, grease pencil is another idea for, you know, for marking the side of your container um, or, or a different marker that's, you know, really made specifically for, for gardening, right? So they, they do exist, but I'd really recommend the industrial Sharpie um, to label your container. Okay, so a couple options there for labeling ideas. Um, for vinyl blinds, for these vinyl blinds, if you have or using vinyl blinds, you can simply use a pencil. Pencil is sufficient um, and it will last years without fading, believe it or not. So try it and, uh, and you can, uh, you'll find that you probably will like that, uh, that option. All right, um, so we have our containers, you're labeling things, and now we have to uh, create a closure for it. We gotta close it, all right? And there's several options for closing uh, the containers. Uh, we kind of talked about this already, but I just want to, you know, give you some pictures to look at. Um, I prefer to use uh, the wire. You just use simple wire. You know, rubber coated wire is, is certainly fine um, to use. Um, some people like to use duct tape. It's also an option, as you see here, uh, duct tape on the sides. Some like to use duct tape the whole way around, right? Duct tape the whole way around with using this hinge. Uh, some people like that because it's easier to, if you're, when you're checking it out, it's easier to pick it up. It's more secure using, um, you know, using the duct tape there. Okay. And the third option right here um, is to use, uh, to make vertical cuts, vertical slits in the sides and the, in the top um, and slide the top portion over the bottom, right? So you're making slits in, in the bottle. Uh, and it slips down over top uh, into the bottom. And this is, works good for like symmetrical you know, bottles and um, you can sacrifice the hinge. You're gonna sacrifice the hinge basically, uh, but so be careful if you, if you do this option and um, you forget that it's actually um, cut and uh, you pull your container up and everything flies, you know, flies out, all right? Um, produce containers nowadays snap together pretty easily. You know, the, I, the produce containers that we use at the store and we're buying them, they snap together pretty firm. Um, so that they're really good to use as well. Um, but you can also use some tape on the sides of those or even ties, uh, the rubber ties too, to keep it secure. All right. Okay, so we have closures. Um, we're making some progress. Hopefully at home you have something um, looking similar to, to, to this with your, making your cuts and you have your closures here and for my perennial mix I have a we're making doing some doing a perennial mix a wildflower mix on this one so I labeled it using my commercial uh, commercial marker and filled it with soil so I have my soil all ready to go inside I have my uh, tip of sub you can see these drainage holes in the bottom so you can see that so we're ready ready to go as far as um, putting it outside, all right? So you wanna put your container outside now, all right? So before you um, yeah, deposit your container outside, as you see the, in the picture here, and this is pretty much, uh, we've had a lot much more snow than this this year, um, but you wanna make sure you saturate the soil, right? So make sure you saturate them. You can set them in a sink or in a, in a container of water um, and let that soil uh, take up the, the water, uh, absorb the water uh, from the bottom um, so everything is moist, right? Uh, without disturbing the seed, right? So if you pour water on top, it's going to disperse the seeds, put it into a container of water, let it soak up 
uh, the, the water, okay? Now they go outside, but where do you put them outside, right? Um, containers that are sealed, uh, like with duct tape, you know, they won't dry out as quickly in, in the windy areas. So just consider that. Um, containers that are closed with, with the wire coat, so with the wire, coated wire, like I like to use, um, they're easier to open to check for progress as time goes by, okay? Um, milk jugs with the smaller containers, they can topple pretty quickly in, in inclement weather. Um, and if you're like me, we have, you know, we have a dog outside. So put it in an area that's going to be undisturbed as best you can. Okay. Um, you can also use crates like the first picture we talked about. Uh, you can get some, your milk jugs, you can find some, some crates to put them in to keep them in, you know, in certain areas. Um, for milk jugs, another another idea that I've seen take place, you can thread uh, a broom handle uh, or a piece of PVC through the handle of the jugs and um, um, kind of keeps them in, in fashion, keeps them in rows. Um, if your pets are very active like mine, um, you know, set your containers out uh, out of reach somehow, you know, away from the away from the pets or up on a table somewhere. OK, and also just avoid their low spots. If you have low spots and uh, or standing water or in a rainstorm, make sure you're, you're not putting them in those areas. All right. So let's jump in and talk a little bit about seedlings. Um, Carrie, how are we doing with time? We have uh... Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, Andy. Oh, wow. OK, so I'll get going here. Um, seedlings. So um, water uh, when you know when you're going to water the containers, when it becomes too dry, make sure you're checking, especially in the early spring. Well, when you get that intense sunshine and that can dry out the container, you know, pretty quickly. Uh, if you water your containers before setting out, um, you should have an idea of, uh, of their weight, you know, when properly moist. And uh, they may look dry when they're frozen, but the weight, you know, will tell you what, if it's true or not. So check your containers periodically. Uh, and make sure that they're, they're still moist uh, and water as needed. And then you can transplant them, right? Transplant them, um, you know, transplant when yeah, and the nighttime temperatures are really appropriate for the type of seedling uh, being grown. Broccoli um, can take cooler temperatures where tomato wants, uh, wants it warmer. Okay, so some things to think about as we're transplanting. This is just a timeline to show you uh, the timeline of, of transplanting. So, you know, we're planting your seeds, making your containers, your weight you begins to sprout, your seeds begin to sprout, you start to have true leaves, okay? Um, and then the leaves start to open and then they're fully open to that point, you can start to transplant them. Right. So hardening off, you know, winter sown seedlings, um, it's not an arduous task, like hardening off indoors. Right. So it's another benefit of, of having them outside. They're already hardened off. So you don't have to be taking these inside, outside, inside, outside. Um, you know, once the seedlings make the first true leaves, then you can begin gradually opening the container. Uh, more light inside and moisture, and uh, they'll be growing much faster at that point, okay? All right, uh, we need to talk about seeds, all right, seed selection. So most seed vendors really haven't caught up with this notion of winter sowing just yet, right? Um, and so you might not see it mentioned in some of these seed catalogs, I, I haven't. Um, so you have to really play a little bit detective when you're, when you're um, selecting your seeds, all right? So read your seed catalogs, um, and see packets carefully. Uh, look for some keywords uh, that really indicate, you know, good candidates for your seed selection right, for winter sown, right? A um, couple of things to look for when you're looking through your magazines or your seed packets. Pre-chill, stratify, self-sowing, tolerates frost, hardy seeds, sow outdoors in the fall, early spring or late winter. All right, these are all words. If you see that would make a great selection for planting um, and for winter sowing in these containers, okay? So make sure you're looking for some of these keywords, okay? All right, next, when to winter sow? We're kind of talking about this, but I think to me, the best time really is right after the kind of hustle and bustle of the holidays, uh, you know, when we can't wait for spring anymore and see catalogs are coming in to your mailbox, you know, on a daily basis and showing up in your mailbox. Um, January and February, perennials, hardy annuals, uh, cool season vegetables. So brassica and allium families, all right, are important. Brassicas are your cabbages, um, broccoli, and we love kale, like I mentioned before, turnips, uh, cauliflower, uh, mustards, and so forth. So those are brassicas as the brassica family. Uh, also is our alliums, right? So they're also good for 
um, this time of year, right now, onions, shallots, um, uh, garlic, scallions, chives. Yeah, chives are great to start too. So these are good things to start uh, right now in February timeline. Now, once you get into March, um, you can start to do more you know, half hearty annuals, herbs, and, and most vegetables. Okay, so that's kind of the time when you think about that. Think about these, these items here in the brassica and allium families now. Um, and then once you get into March, you can do more annuals, herbs, um, and vegetables. Okay, so, um, you know, you can really wait, you know, you can wait until about April to sow tomatoes, uh, cucurbit family. So the cucurbit family uh, made up of cucumbers, uh, squash, um, pumpkins, and, and melons. So you can start to do those uh, in the April timeline. Okay. Um, you know, and the good thing about this too is that remember they're going to be very hardy uh, when you're doing this outside. So again, um, you can easily transplant them into your into your garden or raised bed, um, and there won't be any lag time, okay, or less lag time, which is a really uh, upside to this. All right, all right. Beyond winter sowing annuals uh, in April, then so we get as we get in the the season warms up, it's time to sow more tender annuals. Um, the ones that are native in the warmer zones, um, they're great to do. So, you know, Angelonia, Cosmos, um, Dahlias, we have a lot of marigolds, petunias, sunflowers, you know, are good to do right in April timeline. Okay, so that's a good time to do that. So you're continuing to do this uh, into the spring time. Uh, what not, what's not advised, so this is not advised for winter sowing. Quick, quick maturing vegetables like radishes, okay, don't do radishes. Uh, root root vegetables, all right. There's they have a, the tap system, um, so don't do any kind of root vegetables. Um, seeds that may rot in cool soil, like beans or maybe corn, you can stay away from those. Okay, plants that might bolt quickly in response to rising temperatures, um, and the seed packets will indicate these. Um, and tropical seeds, okay. If you try using winter sown containers, like in late spring, you can do that, right? For any kind of tropical tropical seeds. Right, um, you know, most of all with this, just yeah, experiment with winter sowing. Just you know, it's it's very enjoyable. Um, you know, you will have a wonderful you know growing season. Here's some pictures of some of our um, community folks that have tried uh, winter sowing and then they're uh, transplanting into their garden. Um, we have some really good pictures that have come in from master gardeners and community folks about uh, winter winter sowing. So thanks to everyone for sending those in. And uh, I think we have uh, if you have more questions. After the session tonight, please connect with your local extension office. Uh, most states across the nation have extension office, okay? Um, here in Pennsylvania, uh, you can reach out to our garden hotline, all right? Each county has a garden hotline where you can ask questions. Uh, simply type the name of the county. Uh, I live here in Center County, so centermg at psu.edu. That'll take you right to a handful of master gardeners that can answer questions uh, and help you out, okay? And um, I think the last thing we have, Carrie, is one last pull. So with the information tonight, we try, obviously you're here for a reason. So you want to try winter sowing. Uh, you going to try winter sowing this year? Yes, maybe, uh, or no. I hope I've been able to entice you some bit, entice you a bit, entice you some, some more into trying uh, winter sowing and uh, just experiment with it. The, the hardest part is just to get started. But if you start tonight, like you did with some milk containers, start to make some cuts, adding some soil, purchase some soil, um, potting mix, all right, not soil, potting mix, um, you can start, select some seeds and, and try it out. What's our results? Great. Okay, we have 81% say yes. Okay, good. I did, uh, did my job here tonight. Some say maybe, 18% said maybe, and a couple uh, ones person said no. Um, I encourage you to try it, <laughs> okay? So we have a couple of minutes left uh, for questions. Um, I'm gonna unshare my screen here. And if you have any questions for Carrie, if there's any, any questions that are tough. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions. So I'll start with, um, there are a few kind of specific to um, what you shared here tonight. So uh, Gloria yeah. asked, should the containers be placed away from a building or under an overhang? Um, it's it's okay to place them uh, under an overhang, but remember, if they're not getting any type of moisture, that's not good, right? So 
Um, if you have a partially a partial overhang or if you have an area where um, maybe it's on, um, say, they, uh, a western side, western facing, um, that's good, whether it might be flowing to the north, you know, west, west or east. Um, you need some moisture to get into the container. So not completely over and overhang, that's not what I'd recommend. Uh, but if you could get partially, that's good. You want snowpack or any kind of moisture rain to fall on that container. And Sue wants to know if you have any techniques to help prop the top of the container open as you're um, filling them. Yeah, I, you know what? I, um, do you have an extra hand at home? If you have anyone at home that could help, <laughs> my son just helps me. But he holds it open and I fill it. Um, they're pretty light, the container. So like for this instance, I just grab it up, grab, pull the backside on your hinge, uh, just pull it back and then I just have a small trial and I'm just loading it in, inside um, as you go forward. So um, that's my technique. It's pretty rudimentary, but it works. All right, and David kind of has just a general gardening question here. He said he sure. read an article that suggested that tree trimming is best undertaken at this time of year. Is this true? And if so, why is this the best time? And does, is this also applicable to bushes and shrubs? Uh, so the, the answer is it all depends on, on the species, right? Um, so most times if you're for woody, woody ornamental plants, um, and even for say, um, say if you have an oak tree or, or a maple tree, right? Um, you, know, you, can, you can really prune, the best time to really prune them is, is midsummer time, right? After the flower, you give a flowering crab apple. Um, after the flower takes place and the flower drops, um, you can prune those types of plants. Uh, when you're talking about fruit bearing crops, it's different, right? Um, most important part to remember is that there's a cycle involved in plants. And so when plants are growing, they're producing fruit um, and they may start to initialize setting bud for the next season. So if you are into um, late fall, like for right now, most apple orchards on the East Coast are starting to do some, some pruning here in February and in, in March. Um, they're waiting too long, then they're going to Cut, remove the buds of the plant right for the following season so it really depends on what specifically we're talking about um, if you go on to your the extension website and search for a specific plant um, and pruning maintenance on those you can find specific timelines for for what you're talking about okay awesome and then yeah we are kind of running out of time here so we'll just uh one last question here um Let's see, Amber wants to um, know if you can comment on seed density when sowing. Seed density. So the, I'm thinking you're, you're asking about as far as um, quantity of seed sowing. Um, so that's a good question. And that's what your, your question is that you, can you overseed? Yes. Right. So if you do plant, um, if you're seeding and maybe you do mix some sand in there, they kind of disperse it, uh, but that doesn't help. You still have a lot of seeds that are germinating. You have to go through and, and remove those, right? And, and sort them out and break them apart. Um, so yes, you can overseed a certain area, uh, but you need to go back in and separate uh, as time goes on. Okay, so that, that's really important to do. And that's okay, that's, that's common, very common. Awesome. Well, it looks like that's about all the time we have. We do have some more questions. So I would maybe just encourage, um, you know, you guys to, to reach out to Andy. I'll include his contact information and a follow-up email after the event. Um, we'll also have some links where you can join the um, their newsletter and, and links to just the Master Gardener website. That's just a wealth of information um, on all things gardening. So Andy, thank you so much for your time today. I hope everybody enjoyed the program and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Good night. Thank you for having me. It's good to see everyone. Thank you.